and welcome to Something's Off with Andrew Heaton. I'm your host, Andrew Heaton, and I really like your hat. Not a lot of people would have literal electric neon on a hat, but you do, and it's one of the many reasons that we're friends and you're a snappy dresser. And the program you're listening to is brought to you by razor-tipped wind turbines from Skyblades. If you're like most people, you probably get mass-produced factory electricity at your house. But let me tell you, there's nothing quite like fresh, homemade electricity you collect right from your very own wind turbine. Whether you're operating your toaster or simply keeping all the lights on in your house because you're terrified of burglars, you can really see the difference in fresh, high-quality electricity over that stale, store-bought stuff the electric companies pump into your walls. Something else worth considering is, what if your electricity expires? Sure, it keeps pretty well if you keep it cool and dry, but it can only last several weeks even then. Do you really want to flip the switch on your hot tub come December, only to realize your electricity has gone bad? Times like that, it's good to have a razor-tipped wind turbine on hand. And in much the same way that life is just cozier with fresh homemade electricity, given how many geese one of those suckers manages to kill, you've also got an unlimited supply of fresh pillows. I don't know how often you buy fresh pillows, probably once or twice a month, I'm guessing. But if you have a razor-tipped wind turbine in your yard, every night you can scoop up a couple of bags of feathers and have the best night sleep of your life. Did you know pillows expire? It's true. And let me tell you, friends, the last thing you want to do is be resting your sweet head on an expired pillow. It's filthy, and it's how people develop scrum pox. So install a razor-tipped wind turbine in your yard and fill your life with fresh electricity and abundant goose feathers from geese that are savagely shredded to death by a massive flying pinwheel. The razor-tipped wind turbine from Skyblades. Flay with all the colors of the wind. And now it's time for a day in the life of Joe Biden. 3 a.m. Call a random number and whisper, I love you. Hang up and go back to sleep. 9.30. Rise and shine. Make coffee while listening to Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go by Wham. 10 o'clock. Attend Washington Rotary Club meeting and greet club president with warm, friendly handshake for 22 consecutive minutes. 10.30. Give speech to Rotary Club on the importance of civic engagement and bipartisanship. Make effort to personally thank and hug everyone attending. Chase several club officers into the parking lot to make sure they aren't left out of all that hugging. Wander into traffic to shake hands with commuters. 11 o'clock. Lunch at the Occidental near the White House. Hold hands with waitress while going through the menu for 22 consecutive minutes. 11.30. Helpfully feed strawberries to dining companions. 12 o'clock. Wander into the Occidental's kitchen to thank chefs for their fine work by giving them all bear hugs. 12.30. Head to the Ritz for a semi-secret meeting with potential VP running mates. 12.45. Arrive at the Ritz. Give free unsolicited testicular cancer test to Pete the doorman. 1 o'clock. Talk with Stacey Abrams about giving her a potential cabinet position in the forthcoming Biden administration. Celebrate agreement with a formal Eskimo kiss. 1.30. On the way out of the Ritz, give a free unsolicited memory exam to Pete the doorman. 1.45. Go to the dog park. Pet all the dogs. 2.30. Go to a retirement center. Pet all the old people. 2.45. Text John Bolton. Hi, can I feel your mustache? 3 o'clock. Ditch Secret Service guys and head to the fabric store. Spend an hour rubbing silk fabric samples before doing stretches on the shag carpet. 4 o'clock. Go to Arlington National Cemetery to deliver eulogy for former two-star general Richard M. Heddleston. After speech, climb inside of the coffin to give the big fella a goodbye hug before he goes to heaven. 4.30. Head over to Congress to boost morale through heartfelt, bipartisan tickling. 5.30. In accordance with blue-collar, rust-belt upbringing, take the underground metro system back to Georgetown, just like a regular guy. Sit in the lap of anyone who makes eye contact. 6 o'clock. Dinner at Clyde's of Georgetown with campaign manager. While campaign manager is talking about delegate stuff, 
quietly remove shoes and see if I can fit my foot in her pocket. Maintain eye contact the entire time. 6.30, get phone call from doctor. Doctor says, there's been a mix up in your medications meant to prescribe you blood thinner, sent you ecstasy by mistake. Hope there haven't been any complications. Apologies. My guest today is Robert Zubrin. He is the founder of the Mars Society. He is the author of The Case for Mars, and he is the president of Pioneer Astronautics. Uh, Robert, thank you for coming on. Thanks for inviting me. And I, I wanted to talk to you about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, which is moon bases. Uh, so I thought we could, we could kind of go down the wonk hole on uh, space exploration, or I, I guess more aptly, uh, uh, near space uh, colonization. Uh, and I, I think you're, you're kind of both on board for moon bases and Mars bases, aren't you? Yes, I am. Um, so with a, a moon base, uh, I'm my enthusiasm is boundless for having a colony on the moon. Uh, the, the coolness factor is overwhelming for me. But from a from, you know, a physical perspective, if, if, we, if we wanted to back it up, what are the scientific advancements or, or scientific uh, types of tests that we could do on a moon base that we can't otherwise do? Well, um, there's some. I mean, we could. Uh, uh, the most exciting thing to do on the moon is astronomy, in my view. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, radio astronomy from the backside of the moon would be shielded from interference from Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, optical astronomy can be done on the surface of the moon. There's no atmosphere. And um, what you could do is you could station arrays of telescopes and coordinate them to produce uh, images with the resolution of the diameter of the array instead of the diameter of individual telescopes. You know, like this very large array of radio telescopes we have in New Mexico, mm -hmm. you see all the radio dishes stretched out. They synthesize a, a, a giant radio telescope with that. Well, you could do that in the optical on the moon. And if we did that, we could actually image Earth-like planets around other stars. Wait, hold on. So we could actually say like look at uh, uh, Alpha Centauri and we, we could get a visual of the planets that are that are orbiting them yeah and be uh, I mean it wouldn't be that good a picture but you'd probably be able to distinguish things like continents and seas and that sort of thing uh, okay sold I'm, I'm amazed by that so and you wouldn't be able to confirm life but if, if you saw continents and seas and you saw splashes of green on them there there at least be some indication that there might be uh, you know vegetable life on another planet which would be a huge deal yeah, but in addition, you could probably confirm life uh, be, if you took the spectrum of the planet's atmosphere, if you found a lot of a oxygen in it, that's pretty much a giveaway for life. That There was no oxygen in Earth's atmosphere until we had plant life here to put it there. Okay. Oxygen doesn't like to stay in the atmosphere. It likes to react. So you have to keep putting it back up, and that's what life does. Okay, and if and if we had these uh, these radio telescopes put on the moon, we, we would have the the clarity necessary uh, and the um, the lack of, of radiation interference in order to get those better uh, pictures. Well, the optical telescopes um, are the ones that give you the pictures. The uh, radio telescopes do other kinds of imaging. Okay, uh, and you know, I mean, here's the thing about astronomy. Um, a lot of people think astronomy is fun, but what's the use? I mean, what's the practical use? In fact, most of our knowledge of physics has come from astronomy. Our knowledge of, of gravity and classical physics came from astronomy. Newton's laws were discovered by discovering the laws of planetary motion. Our, our knowledge of electromagnetism, our knowledge of nuclear fusion, of relativity. Uh, and there are, I believe, new fundamental discoveries in physics waiting to be discovered and the best way to do it, or the most probable way to do it, is astronomy, because the universe has a giant lab, and it has energies available to it much higher than anything we can build in our own accelerators. And this is why astronomy has, has led physics historically and um, could do uh, again. Okay. Uh, well, and I'll add to that, there's also a fair amount of, um, if, if it is a moon base rather than a... Uh, uh, you know, a, a robotic observatory or something like that, there's also additional experimentation that's just going to have to happen in terms of what the human body can withstand uh, outside of the bounds of Earth. Uh, it, it's my understanding, and I could be wrong about this, but I think with the International Space Station, we're still shielded from a lot of the electromagnetic energy from the sun. And so we don't really have a clear idea of what long-term uh, space does to human beings. But if we had a moon base, we'd pretty much have to figure that out in order to keep the people from getting fried. Well, actually, um, it's sort of the other way around. Oh, On a moon bad. base, we 
we, we could uh, readily shield astronauts with the, the sacks of, uh, you know, sandbags of moon dirt. We okay. could shield the, the habitat. It, it, at the space station, uh, they are exposed to cosmic rays at half the rate they ah. would be in interplanetary space because the Earth blocks out half the sky. But, you know, like they just had these, uh, well, these twins, uh, one stayed in space for a year, the other stayed on Earth. And, uh, well, there wasn't that much difference in them after the year, except the one in space had some uh, side effects of long-term exposure to zero gravity that does weaken your muscles and bones. Mm -hmm. But no radiological effects were observed. Okay. And in fact, there's about a dozen astronauts and Russian cosmonauts who've been in space for a year or so, and we don't see any radiological effects on them, which is not to say that there might not be any, but they're not uh, drastic. They're not profound. They're probably a statistical risk of about 1% that you'll get cancer later in life. Frankly, living in Houston and having the <laughs> chemical fumes is a higher, and I'm not kidding, it's a higher risk okay. than that. Um, so NASA bureaucrats who don't want to go to Mars sometimes use the radiation uh, risk the way a 10-year-old uses three inches of snow. I can't go to school today. It's too dangerous. Um, you know, this is their snow day. Uh, but the, the, frankly, the data from the space station does not support that. Really? Okay. Well, then on, on that note, because I, I, I sense uh, a, a little bit of, of either hostility or at least a different game plan than, than the current leadership at NASA. Um, where, where are they? It seems to me that every few years a president says we should go to Mars. I, I remember very clearly George W. Bush saying that we should have a manned mission to Mars. I think Trump alluded to that. Is that is, is a, a moon base or a, a, a Mars installation in the works for NASA at all? And, and is that something that you would want them to do? Okay. Well, um, Vice President Pence has announced uh, that it is the goal of the Trump administration to have Americans back on the moon by the end of 2024. That is uh, before the end of a Trump second term, should he win one. Okay. However, the plan they're pursuing will not achieve that. They are actually continuing with this Obama administration plan to put a space station around the moon, which is of no utility whatsoever. It will cost a fortune to build, a fortune to maintain, and it will actually add to the propulsion requirements and the timing requirements of every moon mission that's forced to use it. And they'll all be forced to use it because otherwise it will be exposed to the fact that they never needed it in the first place. I think you, 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 you describe very well how many, many public sector projects operate. Please continue. Yeah, no, this was a, a big disappointment to me because I, I met Bridenstine, who's the current NASA administrator, mm -hmm. uh, after Trump appointed him, but before he was confirmed, he was in Congress then. Yeah. And he seemed like a real smart and a, a, a straight arrow to me. And here were these Obama holdovers pushing this ridiculous plan. And I thought he'd come in like Moses coming down from Mount Sinai and throw the golden calf off the altar <laughs> and, and, and say, this is stupid. Let's do something intelligent. Let's actually get to the moon. Instead, he starts dancing around the golden calf. And it's it's ridiculous. This is not a purpose-driven program. It's a vendor-driven program. That They're not uh, spending money to do something. They're doing things in order to spend money. And that's not the way to get to the moon in five years. We could get to the moon in five years. There's no doubt about it. Really? Okay. So we got yeah, what would that what would that look like? Because I, I, I don't know the first thing about about building a lunar installation, but it, it sounds like it would be fairly complicated, laborious and expensive. What would what would the cost be? And then it, once we secured that funding, what would a, a moon based construction look like? OK, well, there's a couple of different plans on offer. Um, uh, one option would be which is the option that's more or less in NASA's mind, which is to um, sort of use the same strategy that we used in Apollo, which was known as Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, mm -hmm. where uh, you leave a capsule in orbit around the moon and you go to the surface in a small landing craft that goes to the surface and it comes back to the capsule and the astronauts get back in the capsule and they take that home. Okay. Now, uh, that plan uh, worked. It's not the best plan for a lunar base because you have to do this rendezvous every time you return. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a lunar base should be able to make its propellant uh, from lunar ice, and, um, and in which case there's no advantage to staging your return propellant in orbit. But if you did want to do that plan, if you were unimaginative, you could execute that plan right now if they chose to use the SpaceX Dragon spacecraft, okay. which only weighs 10 tons. But a baseline for them is to use the Orion spacecraft, which is developed by Lockheed Martin, which weighs 26 tons, and it's too heavy for them to be able to do the mission, even using the heavy lift 
SLS uh, Space Launch System, which is another scandal, uh, because this program's been going for 30 years and is yet to fly. And uh, I mean, I was involved in the initial design of it in 1988, which is unbelievable. The Saturn V, we, the contract was cut in 1962. It flew in 1967. And, and we were inventing it as we went along. This thing, the SLS, is basically a, a, shut, a space shuttle uh, launch stack without the, the airplane-like orbiter attached to it. And uh, when we designed it, we thought this would be the simplest thing for them to do. We, it's just deleting the orbiter from the shuttle launch stack. Instead, they've now taken three times as long as it took to develop the whole shuttle including that launch stack in the first place Wait, in so, the 1970s. So, so, so there's been a, a long-running, inefficient uh, a collaboration between a defense contractor and the United States government that's been expensive and, and not terribly useful? Go on. I, I, I can hear your shock. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away by Lockheed Martin's just taking that money? Wow. Well, that one's, that one's Boeing. Lockheed oh, is Martin's it? Okay. The Orion. Oh, yeah, okay, so yeah. They got, each one has their own uh, cross to bear. Uh and apology to make. But SpaceX has, because they're doing things not on cost plus contracts, but fixed price contracts in which actually they're contributing a significant fraction of the money themselves, mm -hmm. they're spending the money like it's theirs. And they were able to develop a heavy lift booster in half the time at 1 30th the cost mm. that's projected for SLS. And it's flying now. In fact, it's going to fly tomorrow again for the second time the falcon heavy and if we use the orion excuse me not the orion if yeah. we use the dragon and the falcon heavy and then probably you would need two falcon heavies one to deliver the lunar excursion vehicle and the other to deliver the capsule you could do a lunar orbit rendezvous type moon mission now i have my own moon mission plan which is a, a different concept is that is that moon moon direct because i think i've read about that yes it is it's yeah please, please please spell that out for us yeah and uh, people can read about that. Uh, I actually have a new book coming out called The Case for Space. Uh, hmm. It's uh, just got off the print run and it'll be on sale starting May 14th. And it explains the plan. Um, the, uh, there's also op-eds and so forth, Moon Direct available online. Mm -hmm. Now, the basic idea here, once again, uh, we're gonna use the Falcon Heavy. And first we use it to just land directly a couple of habitation modules on the surface of the moon with no people in it. Okay. So the Falcon Heavy can lift 60 tons to Earth orbit, which means it could deliver 10 tons to the surface of the moon. So we do a couple of launches like that. We land a couple of base habitations, we land a couple of houses on the moon, if you will. I'm, I'm, now, in my mind, I'm picturing RVs, but something similar, like some, some modular living structure we would drop off. That's right. The okay. way I view it, think of a big tuna can about uh, uh, 24 feet in diameter okay. and 12 feet tall. All right, nice. Okay, with two decks um, and uh, so forth. Okay. Now, um, the so now we've got a couple of houses sitting on the moon, and maybe one of them is also filled with all sorts of things like solar panels and lunar rovers and mm -hmm. stuff that we would want to have available for us. It's all put in place in advance of the crew. Right. And we would land it at, near the south pole of the moon, which, by the way, is the place the Trump administration has selected, which is a good decision because that's where the ice is. Now, the um so now we have to do a crew um now what i'm postulating is is a vehicle comparable to the apollo lunar excursion module which was a nice little lightweight craft it didn't have any thermal protection or anything because it wasn't designed for re-entry it was just designed to travel in space mm -hmm. okay with a hydrogen oxygen stage that is capable of doing um well i'm going to use a technical term here a delta V velocity change okay. of six kilometers a second, which is the velocity change. It takes three kilometers a second to take off from the moon and head straight back to Earth. And another three kilometers a second, if you're coming back to Earth, will propulsively capture you in low Earth orbit. Similarly, if you're in low Earth orbit, six kilometers a second will take you from there to soft landing on the moon. So this vehicle has that capability. Um, now, to, if you if this vehicle had a has a, a weight of four uh, excuse me of two tons which is the weight of the apollo lunar excursion module um with built with 1960s materials uh if we were to build that again but instead of using the kind of chemical propulsion they use then we use hydrogen oxygen um which is the best um you it would take six tons of propellant so it would have a, a total weight of eight tons 
Now, if you remember, our cargo lander can deliver 10 tons to the surface of the moon. So it could deliver this fully fueled to the surface of the moon. Okay, so we, we deliver cargo to the lunar surface. Uh, at what point do human beings show up? All right, once we have the cargo emplaced on the lunar surface, then uh, we do the next mission, employing the cargo delivery system and people, and this is how we do it. We need to create a vehicle, I call it the Lunar Excursion Vehicle. It's similar to the Apollo Lunar Excursion Module, which had a dry mass of two tons with uh, 1960s materials, except we have a hydrogen oxygen stage for it instead of the kind of chemicals they use. And hydrogen oxygen is much more powerful. Okay. And the um, and this has enough propulsive ability uh, to do, and I'm going to use a technical term here, a delta V, a velocity change of six kilometers a second, which is what you need to travel either from low Earth orbit to land on the surface of the moon or to travel from the surface of the moon and propulsively capture in low Earth orbit. Okay. Okay. One way, either way. Okay. Okay. And we and, and, and uh, now this, this is this is sort of a this is a vehicle which is shuttling between the surface of the moon and whatever the the, the Falcon that's got the supplies up to the the uh, low Earth orbit. Yes, it's okay. traveling between low Earth orbit and the surface of the moon. Gotcha. Okay. Now, but here's the thing: it has a dry mass of two tons. If we're using hydrogen oxygen. In order to do the kind of maneuver that I just described, it would need six tons of propellant. So it would have a total weight of propellant plus its dry mass of eight tons. Now, if you remember, our cargo lander can deliver 10 tons. So it can deliver this with its fuel. Okay. okay it's got a, it an additional back. two tons. So either, either more supplies or very fat astronauts. But either way, two tons worth of cargo. Of, of extra beyond right. this. That's right. Okay. All right. But it's got margin. Uh, so... We deliver this to Earth orbit, uh, and then we send a Falcon 9, which is the SpaceX workhorse launch vehicle. They launch one every two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, they cost $70 million to launch, and that takes the crew up with a Dragon. They meet in Earth orbit. The crew transfers from the Dragon to the lunar excursion vehicle, uh, and then the cargo lander delivers the lunar excursion vehicle with the crew to the surface of the moon where they land near all these habitation modules that we landed on the moon before. Mm -hmm. And then they get out, they set up the houses, they get the base operating. And once that's done, they go and they travel to the craters where the ice is frozen and they start mining ice to bring back to the base to turn into hydrogen, oxygen, rocket propellant. Okay. And then, and then they fly back to the moon, uh, from the moon to low earth orbit where they can either meet the same dragon that launched them in the first place or a dragon that has been launched to deliver the next crew that's going to the moon. Anyway, they take a dragon back down to the ground. Now, this goes on for a few missions like this until we have fully operational propellant making on the moon. And now we have a fuel depot on the moon. And then once that is done, then to travel to the moon, all we need to do is uh, deliver a crew to orbit in a Dragon, okay, cost $70 million, along with enough fuel to refuel one of these uh, lunar excursion vehicles, which are floating around in Earth orbit now, and we fly it to the moon. And then they can operate on the moon and they can actually use the lunar excursion vehicles refueled at the base to hop around the moon and visit a lot of places on the moon, uh, separated by uh, continental scale distances. Uh -huh. And then they can take, refuel it and fly back to Earth. And so each recurring lunar mission, first of all, can visit a lot of places. And second of all, only requires a single medium lift launch vehicle, $70 million vehicle. In comparison, the NASA current program say, that, that of That sounds expensive, but I'm guessing that it's pretty minuscule compared to the normal cost of getting stuff up there. Yeah, it sure is. And it's very minuscule compared to the NASA program of record, which in addition to building the gateway at a cost of maybe $20 billion, would require each lunar mission to use two SLS launches, uh, one to deliver an Orion to the Gateway and another to deliver a lunar excursion vehicle to the Gateway. Each of those costs $2 billion. They're going to cost $4 billion a mission instead of $70 million. In other words, it's like 50 times as the cost per mission. And it's not even clear they can do it because um, it's not clear that SLS can be launched frequently enough that you could get the crew and its excursion vehicle to the gateway within enough time of each other. Um, and um, uh, so, be, so the, the oh, pole yeah. program is just outright nuts. And, and in fact, um, 
you know, Michael Griffin, who was the NASA administrator for George Bush and who is currently an undersecretary of defense for Trump, has uh, openly stated that he thinks their plan is, uh, and I quote, stupid. Uh, now, he, the obvious improvements would be to replace Dra uh, Orion with Dragon, in which case you could do it with a single SLS. Well, hold on. So instead of two. before we, because I, I do, I, I very much want to talk to you about kind of the, the private sector and public sector and how they how they go into space travel. Before we do that, um, I did a, a couple of real quick questions. What would what, what do you see as the the crew, the crew complement of a moon based being? How many people would be stationed there? Well, it, initially we keep it small, but once we have the the lunar propellant making, um, there's no. First of all, instead of coming back in two weeks, why not come back in two months? And then it, you could be launching people to the moon. You could launch them once a month, and you could go from a crew of four to a crew of eight because you'd have overlapping crews, four coming in, four out at a time. And then if you stay for four months, you could have a, a base complement of 16 okay. with, once again, each uh, group uh, tra uh, traveling like that. So we, we, we'd have uh, 8, 12, 16 people on the moon with about four in transit uh, at any particular hmm. time. And what would, um, if, if you, um, you know, if, if the administration got behind you and, and endorsed this plan and, and Congress likewise endorsed this plan, what would the time frame be from now to when we had a fully operational moon base? And also, what would the total cost be? Well, I, I think um, that we could definitely have this thing operated by 2024. And I think that if you offered SpaceX the contract to build the lunar excursion vehicle at, uh, you know, $1 billion fixed price, they'd be laughing all the way to the bank. Hmm. And uh, instead of, you know, $10 billion in 10 years and, 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 and furthermore, more per year as the program is endlessly delayed and, and they keep adding to the tab. But also, um, the, the NASA budget something like twenty-one billion right now, isn't it? So, like, you could, yes. in theory, if you were to shuffle that around, you, with, could could you do that within the confines of the existing NASA budget? Absolutely, you oh, could do okay. it. You could do it with the money they wasted on the Gateway. The, last year they spent five hundred million on the Gateway. This year they spent eight hundred million on the Gateway. That's one point three billion. That alone would be enough to pay for the lunar excursion vehicle if it was done in the private sector on a fixed price contract. You make money if you can do it cheaper than this. You lose money if it costs you more than this. Mm -hmm. But you'll make money using the vehicle later. Uh, but you'll, you know, you don't start making money until it's flying, as opposed to continue to make money uh, for as long as the development program goes and, and stretch it out for thirty years. Okay. Well, so in, in, yeah, NASA. I think NASA should offer SpaceX the following deal, or they should make this an open offer to SpaceX, Blue Origin, or, or even Lockheed Martin if they're willing to take uh, it. Yeah which is the following. We need this lunar excursion vehicle. Um, we are willing to match you dollar for dollar for what you spend on developing it. In other words, we'll pay half. And if you then develop it and it's operational, we'll guarantee you at least 10 flights. Okay, so you're going to lose money on the development, but we're showing good faith by paying half. But the cheaper you make the development, the less money you will lose on the development. Mm -hmm. And the faster you make the development, the sooner you'll start making money on the program. And if they did money uh, business that way, instead of we'll pay you whatever it costs you plus 10%. Right. Um, uh, that's how this thing happens. And you can go to Mars the same way. And we could be on the... And we could be on the moon in five years and on Mars in 10. No question about it. The, the, the government has a tendency to do that model of we'll pay you cost plus 10 percent, which has the effect of great. So if I make my parts out of gold, then I get that much more money. Uh, like it, it's a it's a it's an odd incentive structure. Um, what on, on that note, because I, you, you've clearly thought about the, the public element of this and the private element of this. Uh, you're also very enthusiastic about space exploration and, and space uh, colonization. What do you see as the role of, of the public sector and the private sector moving forward in that realm? Well, OK, here's the thing. Uh, I think we have a public interest in expanding humanity into space and expanding uh, uh, Western civilization into space and expanding the American, I, uh, you know, it's putting our, our stamp on the future. We're going to put okay? Edmund Burke on the moon. Okay. Well, you know, uh, look, uh, we're speaking English here because the English came here. If they had left it to the Spanish, uh, what if they left it to the Turks? I mean, in other words, the, the kind of uh, uh, humanistic ideals of, of Elizabethan England 
uh, became uh, prevalent across a large part of the world and to the great benefit of the world uh, because they went forth. Had they stayed home, uh, the, the, the future would have been stamped with the imprint of others. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think as the most progressive used in, in the dictionary sense of the yeah, term, the, not the, the current, sense, not, yeah, yeah. not, not the current political sense. Not, not a capital P, a lowercase p. Yeah. Uh, a society in, in the world at that time, uh, uh, you know, uh, treasuring individualism and, uh, and so forth. Uh, uh, it was very beneficial that uh, England went forth and, and, and did not leave it to the Ottoman Turks to uh, colonize the Americans. Okay. And the, 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 but if we, so I think anyway, to return to the subject, mm -hmm. I think there's a public interest in doing this. There's also a public interest in uh, achieving the scientific breakthroughs that will come from the knowledge we'll gain from uh, establishing ourselves in space. And there's a public interest in becoming spacefaring because only by doing that, Will we have the capability of diverting asteroids from hitting the Earth? Hmm. You know, we had a hit in in the Bering Sea on December eighteenth of last year, ten times the force of the Hiroshima bomb. Uh, really? Landed. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And so this is not ancient history. This happened a few months ago, and the 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 um, okay, no one was hurt because it landed in 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 the Bering Sea. But there you go. Anyway, there's a public interest in doing this, but we need to use the genius of the private sector to make this happen. And so, you know, NASA, okay, or Congress or the president should pick out important goals to be achieved in space, and then they should uh, uh, put them out for bid, essentially, on fixed price basis. Hmm. And uh, so as you create the, you get the incentive structure to line up where it, it, it benefits the, uh, uh, the people who are creating the new technology to do it as quickly and cheaply as possible. And that's what you've had with uh, SpaceX. Musk spends money like it's his because not all of it, but a lot of it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he doesn't mess around. Uh, and the, the, you know, and this is how we can do it. And we could be on the moon in five years and on Mars in 10. The, Mars is not something that has to be 50 years from now. We are much better prepared today to send people to Mars than we weren't to send men to the moon mm -hmm. in 1961. And we were there eight years later. Okay. And I, I, and I would say something else. If we reform contracting in this way, it will benefit our national defense mm. enormously. Yeah. If we had a national defense procurement system during World War II, like we have now, we would have lost the war. No question about it. We wouldn't have been able to produce anything on time, okay, and and or produce enough of anything within, uh, you know, the, the wildest expenditures. Yeah, because uh, well, because our our, our system would have been primarily designed to get congressmen reelected that have military manufacturers in their base, and to make sure that uh, defense contractors are well paid. With defeating the Nazis being perhaps a third category of uh, or a, a third priority in that structure, I, I think you make a very good point there. Uh, we we yeah. spend a lot of money. We, and we it, it is it is not subject to the same kind of rigors as we have in the private sector, right? So we you know NASA is a lot smaller than Defense Department. Let's use NASA to demonstrate a new a new method of procurement. Actually, it's an old method of procurement that is going back to a more sane method of procurement that we had before the nineteen seventies. Uh, and uh, that allowed us to win World War II, that allowed us to get to the moon, and will allow us to do uh, terrific things again. Uh, I'm I'm enthused. I I do I I am obligated by a few of my friends. I I'm very bullish on space exploration, and I'm a fan of NASA. And uh, but I I have people in my life that view NASA as a kind of bread and circus in space. They see it as a, a distraction. So for for people that would rather spend tax dollars on mosquito nets to combat malaria, or alternately just putting it back in the economy, what would your what would your um your your pitch be to them that that it's a good use of tax dollars? Well, I, I think it's a uh, terrific use of tax dollars provided they're spent well. I mean, you could propose any program you like, including uh, uh, malaria programs. And if the money is wasted, it's wasted. OK, mm, yeah. I mean, you know, whatever the however noble the goal might be. So everything has to be done efficiently. And that includes space. Now, uh, I think uh, we the knowledge we can acquire in space can lead to breakthroughs in physics, uh, which offer un, unparalleled uh, improvements in human life uh, as, as they have. Um, I think that the, um, the challenge of space 
uh, is a way to generate intellectual capital. You know, the number of science graduates in this country uh, doubled during the Apollo period at every level, high school, college, PhD. In fact, it tripled at the PhD level. And um, we've been benefiting from that ever since. Uh, because, you see, what, what a, a Humans to Mars program in particular right now would say to every young person, learn your science and you could be an explorer of new worlds because youth loves adventure. And, and out of that, we'd get millions of young scientists, engineers, inventors, technological entrepreneurs, um, you know, medical researchers. These are the kinds of people that uh, advance society, that improve our national defense, that advance our economy. Uh, you know, I mean, who were the 40-year-old technological entrepreneurs who built Silicon Valley in the 1990s. They were these 10-year-old little boy mad scientists mm -hmm. making rocket fuel in the basement in the 1960s. And um, so w that was the real payoff we got from Apollo. Uh, and then there was another one, okay, which was the intended payoff, which was we astonished the world with what free people could do. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me tell you something, because I, I was a competitive chess player at that time. I was a kid. I uh, I was in Leningrad when we landed on the moon. And um, well, you were in Leningrad I, in the Soviet Union? Yes, I was. Wow, okay. And uh, and I could tell you all the Russians I knew were really impressed and they were positively <laughs> impressed. Yeah. Okay. It, they did not have a positive impression of the United States by what we were doing in Vietnam, mm -hmm. by no means. They had a very positive impression by what we were doing in space exploration. And they got the message that we represented the future, that we represented what was good, that we were the team they should want to be part of. And, you know, uh, and I'm sure everyone behind the Iron Curtain got that message. And, you know, here you have today, you have Putin and the Chinese and the Islamists all saying, oh, you guys were good once, but we're the future. Okay, not you. Well, we need to push back on that. We need to say, no, we're the future. <laughs> this is the future. Freedom is the future. So there's that. That really matters. And then uh, there is another thing. There is uh, the future because um, there is a question of who's going to put their stamp on the future. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, all of my ancestors, without exception, were parents. Okay, people who decided to put yeah, their me, stamp on me the too. I think yeah, I'm, I'm doing. I'll have to, I'm going to have to go through twenty three and me, but I think I think that's me as well. Yeah, we got a lot of yeah. That, that's that. that's how it works, right? Okay, now look, um, I'm not anti-China. Okay, I think the Chinese are, are 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 good people, and I think they have a very interesting civilization, and they have a lot to offer the world. Uh, yeah, I, I say I'm, okay. I think they're lovely people. I'm anti their government. I think their government's yeah. horrible. Right. And the, the, but, you know, uh, uh, I'm perfectly fine with the future, including Chinese, but I don't want the future to be Chinese. I think the future needs to include Americans. Uh, I think we need to be part of that future. Okay. And then together, uh, there'll be a new melting pot in space of, of, of cultures and ideals and, and, and what have you. Uh, but, but we need to be part of it. And, uh, you know, if, if um, we, we decide to stay home, well, then, you know, if other people are the ones who have children, then those children will have other parents than us. Yeah. Okay. And uh, that, that's how I can put it. So uh, do we want to put our stamp on the future? Do we want to be part of the future? Okay. And uh, I think we should. Uh, that uh, we'll, we'll end on that note because it, it's 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 a, a good one. And I, I enjoyed your um, your your argument in favor of that, and I enjoyed all the mechanics walking through it. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. Well, thank you. And once again, if people want to know more about all these ideas, I have a new book coming out. It's called The Case for Space, and uh, it, you can order it on Amazon now, and it'll be available for sale May fourteenth. Great, thank you. Thank you. Listener feedback, let's unpack a couple of things. Here's one. Uh, let me know if you would like me to bring Robert back on to talk about his book. I, I enjoyed talking to him tremendously, and uh, I like doing uh, space wonk policy followed up by aspirational ambition at the end. I thought that was cool. Maybe we'll bring it back on. Let me know if you think that would be a good idea. I'll say a, a bunch of you wrote in about yesterday's episode where we covered the politics of superheroes. Uh, I had Megan Sass on, uh, who is from a decidedly progressive bent, uh, to talk about Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman. Uh, and uh, a couple of you blue gaskets, uh, but uh, the, the rest of you kind of uh, 
um, either really enjoyed it or enjoyed it, but thought that it was not adequately covered. And uh, that is a fair assessment because I do not know superheroes terribly well. Uh, in retrospect, that is a, a topic that I probably should have gone in on with more intellectual ammunition. Not that I'm looking for a fight, nor was Megan, but I, I simply lacked the ability to, uh, uh, to, to go in and, and clarify things or ultimately to push back, uh, which is fair enough. That said, even though your, uh, your emails have been well met in terms of who you think would be a Republican or a Democrat in the superhero world, which unfortunately I, I lack the knowledge to confirm or deny, uh, that said, I appreciated that everybody seemed to enjoy it overall and, uh, and liked having a different perspective, which I think is one of the great valuable things about this program. Um, we hear in the media a lot, you'll hear people say that people tend to live in an echo chamber and they tend to seek out uh, media outlets that make them feel comfortable with what they already believe. If you listen to this program, you're not one of those people. You get a pass. If, if you're a regular listener of Something's Off, uh, you are a person who is thoughtful, civil, and likes hearing different perspectives because we do that all the time. And I'll give you an example. Last week, I had on Phil Robertson, the bearded guy from Duck Dynasty, to talk about Jesus and about how secular people and spiritual people should get along. The following day, after Phil Robertson, who's very, very conservative, I had on Nagin Farsad, who is a Muslim comedian with a penchant for social justice. There aren't any, there are no programs doing that. We're it. We're, we're, you, when you come here, you're going to get a lot of different perspectives, and I think that's a strength to it. So I appreciate it uh, when um, uh, a, a guest might rankle people that they're willing to, to stick through it, uh, and uh, I, I think that it's a benefit. I think right now we, we need to be displaying regularly that you can be good and intelligent and disagree with someone on a matter of substance, and they're still good and intelligent, and uh, you can still be friends and talk about superheroes. So that said, I do want to read uh, one of the emails I got, which I, I enjoyed, and I, I wish that I were uh, up to the challenge of uh, talking about superheroes myself better than I did. Uh, Michael Conqueron, who is a friend of the show and a regular at Snuffies, wrote, when you consider his East Coast old money upbringing and his family's dedication to investing in Gotham City's infrastructure, Batman is a Rockefeller Republican. Superman, being raised by farmers in Smallville, Kansas, but also an immigrant from space, is probably best associated with Kennedy Democrats. And while Wonder Woman is a foreign dignitary, not a citizen, I think her, quote, warrior with compassion, end quote, mindset, opposed to warmongering, excess, uh, excess, excesses best, excuse me, best aligns with Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, fascinating stuff. I, Frank, Michael, I wish that what I should have done is I should have brought you and Megan on, and then I could have been kind of a moderator since I don't know the content as well as either of you do. That said, thank you for that input and for everybody else that wrote in. Unrelated to that, Court 22 writes on iTunes, Andrew delivers the current political topics in a comedic and entertaining way. I started listening when he first started on The Blaze and have enjoyed everything since. Five plus stars. Thank you very much. You guys can watch this whole show on YouTube. If you look for Something's Off with Andrew Heaton, you can see my handsome, bearded face and an assortment of suits, and also that dead bison we screwed on the wall. Watching Something's Off with Andrew Heaton on your computer will only make you seem more sophisticated and amusing at your office or prison cell. So go to YouTube, look for Something's Off with Andrew Heaton, start watching those full episodes, and please do subscribe while you're there. I look like the kind of guy your accountant warned you about. Remember, you can always tweet me at Mighty Heaton or face me, Facebook me at Facebook.com slash Mighty Heaton or even email me by subscribing to my newsletter at MightyHeaton.com and just replying when I send it out on Fridays. Finally, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. That helps other people discover this here political orphanage. Thank you and good day.